Uh, this is amazing. Yeah, this is uh, incredible. This, um, is this is quite the maneuver. <laughs> hey, that's how we roll here in Hamilton. <laughs> yeah. So this is, it occurred to me that this is the 40th anniversary screening because wow. it was it was released in 1981 it was filmed in december in 1980 yeah because we had yeah. to film it for tax credit purposes in the year of 1980 oh yes and um it was filmed um uh, at phil sheridan's studio phil, no, is it phil sheridan yes is that it on church mm -hmm. street mm -hmm. um it was done in toronto it yes. was in Toronto, and one of the reasons mm. it was at the studio was because we wanted control over the sound. And um, part of the philosophy of this film was, or the what was radical about the, this film, was that um, Bill Smith and I we had watched all these. J j Bill is a collector of, of jazz films. Sure. Yeah. And um, we go over to his house and watch jazz films, and most of them, I think Cecil talks about this in the movie where you, you know the, the, um, <clears throat> uh, he talks about the smoky dungeon cafe where there's where the the environment for the music was pretty you know low standard yeah and so what we wanted to do was to elevate the this music that as, as it should be de as it, it's deserved and um, so there's a kind of Elegance and uh, and you know and uh, also we treated it as if it was you know these players were artists that were um, you know um, important enough to to dedicate you know uh, putting them in a in a proper sound environment and with 35 uh, 16 millimeter it was actually this is the first time Super 16 was used in the documentary. Ah which was, it's just wider than 16 millimeter. Um, and it allowed for uh, time code. But the, um, the but the, this was multi-tracked. The whole thing was yes. actually multi-tracked. We were able to get a fantastic sound quality out of McClear Place. Oh, it was a yeah. it, McClear Place Studios. That's yeah. what it was. And Phil yeah. Sheridan was the, uh, the um, engineer. Uh, for well, it. it's interesting you say that, Ron, because huh. all the four artists in the film, Archie Shep, Paul Blay, Cecil Taylor, and Bill Dixon were associated with a 1960s movement that became known as became known as the October Revolution. Right. And one interesting thing about it as a revolution is that it 100% took place in crummy bars, yeah. uh, coffee houses, little cafes in Lower yeah. Manhattan. That was the venue for this very powerful music that yeah, came out of it. Scene. But really, yeah. there was so little mainstream support of any kind for it at the time uh, yeah. made them real revolution uh, revolutionaries they were really marginalized um, I wanted to say something about Bill because he is like so um, I, I, you all have to understand that um, the, the um, um, music just the scene back in the, the 70s when I was um, I worked at Sam the Record Man, which was um, at Young and Dundas, and it was sort of, th this is a time when, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, it was before the internet, before MTV, before any, mm -hmm. you know, um, the, it was, uh, if it wasn't for Bill Smith um, and Gary Topp, actually mm. who ran a club called the edge mm -hmm. um in the 80s and b prior to that um had uh the new yorker and the roxy cinema um, who was also friends with bill these they were catalysts um there was a uh, uh malcolm gladwell wrote a book called the tipping point which talks about how um in each city there is somebody who is a uh, an instigator and um, Bill was an instigator for the music, and John Norris. Of now, if people don't know who uh, the magazine Coda was, the a world class uh, uh, publication that was edited um, um, upstairs of the Jazz Blues Center yes. on King Street, and um, 
And I um, was fortunate enough to be in Toronto at the right time at the right place. And um, having Bill pointing out, like I would not have really been um, introduced to um, the music if it wasn't for Bill. I mean, he brought in Anthony Braxton, Dollar Brand, Cecil Taylor. I saw Archie Shep at, at uh, The Edge, actually. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it w which is Gary Topps' place. So it, it's like even here that we have this going on is because of the people who, um, it's not people who just make the music, it's the whole culture of this providing the space. I made a movie, the last film I made was called Carmine Street Guitars that had a lot of players in it, like Mark Rebo. Um, and he talks about how you need these, um, these individuals like Bill Smith and, and, uh, and uh, Zulu, um, you know, this is all about um, it, the amplification of and allowing this music to happen, a sacred space, you know, or, you know, this is unbelievable, really, mm -hmm. to actually see this in a park and to dedicate this around um, this particular, these artists. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, the one thing about Bill was he was a fan of the music and fan um, also is the root of fanatical. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and he was like, and you know, it, it was like, it, it, he was so, um, knowledgeable deeply he was also a photographer too that and he he cared so much about the music but he was a he was a promoter of music and yes. a player and um and somehow understood um the, his his role in history and and also how he impacted on others like we um somebody like myself completely changed because of Bill Smith and his opening up of, of my uh, world. I work, worked the pop department at Sam's in 1972, 73, 74 when I was in junior high. And um, I, uh, it's, a, it's kind of a long story, but I wound up in the jazz department and I started cracking open records like Albert Eiler and Cecil Taylor and then I would uh, my mind was blown, and then it was Bill's, you know, uh, going to uh, Sackville, to going to Coda, and to uh, the Jazz Blues, and it was a, you know, um, a, an education that opened up, you know, my um, mind and introduced me to artists that w um, I still listen to today, uh -huh. you know, and I've been... Um, so fortunate to be in that, um, you know, not so much, you know, to be around um, players in Canada too, that I, I you know, that uh, Phil Dwyer is a good example of someone who is just this, in, you know, has been, comes out of a completely different tradition, you know, with uh, Oscar Peterson and so on. And I, I just, um, I, you know, had this, a bill, you know, um, what Bill uh, was open to and exposed so many people to was, the, uh, you know, uh, improvised music. Yes. Um, and black music, you know, which is really, you know, and I, I, so when I was in junior high and high school listening to all of this music, I, I became, I loved it so much that I went to Bennington College in Vermont. And that was a, um, where Bill Dixon taught uh, black music with Milford Graves. So you specifically went I to went Bennington to Bennington because, because of Bill D Dixon. Graves and Dixon were there. Yeah, oh, interesting. And um, I w used to play when I was 15, and I was in a jazz band, and I was mm. not very good, <laughs> but I loved it a lot. And I um, you it, shouldn't be when you're 15. No, <laughs> no, it was like that's a, it's another story. It would be an all night uh, event if I had to talk mm. about it. But the um, the one thing that happened at Bennington, it wasn't so much the seeing Milford and Bill and the incredible students that that department produced. Um, also, Cecil Taylor um, taught a lot, of, and Archie taught at UMass, which was just down yes. the street. So, um, in I mean, it's an hour and a half away. I used to hitchhike back and forth between Hampshire College and uh, 
Bennington. And one night at the University of Massachusetts, which is in um, Amherst, um, Northampton, um, there, uh, there was a concert with Rasan Roland Kirk, uh, Vishnu Wood, Max Roach, um, and um, there's another player. And I, I remember going to this concert and Rasan had just uh, had a stroke so he was playing with half of his body and it was a kind of a miracle for me to, to it, that I that I had witnessed and I immediately mm. wanted I had been making movies um, pre in you know prior to college I made a, a weirdly I was just like a weird kid like a nerd that was mm -hmm. playing you know played with film and um, I thought okay I there's a there, um, there's a line out of an Eric Dolphy uh, record on Last Date. At the very end, Eric Dolphy says, um, music's in the air and then it's gone. And I, I kind of, when I saw Rasan, I thought, you know, I, I realized that we needed to document this music or our culture because, um, or it doesn't exist. It's so ephemeral. Yes. And this was like before cell phones. It was before, you know, um, in, you know, um, if it, it it occurred to me that if it didn't get recorded, it didn't exist, yes. and it got it wasn't part of any kind of history. And we had like some jazz films at that time, like uh, the Newport uh, jazz film, Jazz on a Summer's Day. Um, but that was you know, th other than the shorts that Bill uh, Smith showed me, there wasn't a lot out there. Well, the nature of the music, too, is not, live. the music's yeah, not in yeah. the score. Right, you know, right, right. You can't understand an Archie Shep concert by looking at the sheet music. Right, right, So, right. yes, uh, uh, well, there audio was soundtracks and video from, recordings you are know, very important. Like Miles did hit, thing. there was that Louis Mal movie, you know, there were all these, you know, and I would kind of seek it out in terms mm -hmm. of, it's, but in terms of film, there wasn't really None of these players were, were recorded, and they were certainly not on television. Sure. And I was very lucky because um, uh, for circumstances that happened, I knew that I was able to uh, pull it together, pull people together with Bill. These were friends of Bill's. I, I knew Bill mm -hmm. Dixon, but I didn't know Cecil and Archie and, uh, and, um, and Paul. Um, and th th one thing I have to tell you this story about Paul Blay because he's been mentioned a few times is um, on the first so I was a novice filmmaker I was actually 22 you were right uh -huh. I was okay. like so we'll I, the difference I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was um, I started the film when I was 21 but I actually was 22 when I, when I um, was actually there on set and it was so, I had, if you remember, all the, there was like a lot of people there. There was yes. like 80 people, there were three cameras, and I was on the set, and for the first time in so my So actually, life. Ron, you were surrounded by fantastic yeah. professionals and yeah. craftspeople and yeah. artisans. Yeah, Bob and Fresco. It was almost yeah. like, yeah. you know, y you knew how to find people who really, really knew what they were doing. Yeah, very sensitive to mm -hmm. uh, the music. Like, they were quite extraordinary because they mm -hmm. had never, s you know, they had never seen these performers. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, um, we worked with Sandra Cabardis, who was a art director, and mm -hmm. Sandy had... Um, uh, had just done Hollywood movies, and um, I remember seeing John Lennon's Imagine as a, I, I don't know what it was part of, but it was recorded in a white space, and so I wanted mm. it art directed that way. Emil D'Antonio, the political documentary filmmaker who made Millhouse in the Year of the Pig and Point of Order, Rush to Judgment, which I just saw yesterday again, um, he, he made a film called Under, uh, Underground about the weather people, and mm. this movie broke down the uh, third wall. So it had um, the artists in the movie, sorry, the camera people were included in the film to, as a Brechtian kind of uh, 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 technique. And that's why Bill Dixon, for example, you can see me in the, there's like, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and, and when, when Bill is performed, you see the camera cr crew. And so this was like a first time, you know, we're all, uh, the aesthetic 
uh, of Hollywood and television is to conceal everything, whereas mm -hmm. this was about actually we're all participating Showing in this process. event. There's a guy who made um, the Monk film in Last of the Blue Devils. I've forgotten his name for a minute. Mm -hmm. He had a company called Rhapsody Films, and um, he he. Um, he once said that this was an event, like this, like this was a historic event to bring all these people together, and um, and Bill understood it. I didn't, like he had mm. actually lot. We had an audience there, yes, um, mm -hmm. which was quite extraordinary. Um, in the Toronto film scene, the film is also a, it, it's it's pivotal because I, I hired Peter Mettler, um, you know, to, who was a uh, film student, a friend at that time, Bruce McDonald, I think worked on this movie as well. And mm. these were all these uh, friends of mine who were just kind of pooled together at that time. But we were, you know, young and stupid. You know, we were just kind of like, you know, we 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 followed what um, our, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, we were technically learning. As we were going, the one story I wanted to say about Paul Blay, because I completely forgotten this for a minute, was that everybody. The first scene is Paul, and then I'm we're filming, and uh, I have all these people around, and uh, and then you know I just yell cut at the you know at the very end of the piece, and. Um, and everything seems fine, but Paul gets up from his piano, walks over to me, and he says, Ron, just wait a little bit before you, <laughs> you, um, you yell cut. It's like, okay, he whispered this to me, and um, I went, okay. And uh, because the music is still in the air, mm -hmm. and, um, and it lingers, and that's why you see at the very, 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 uh, like in each one of these performances, we just kept, kept it going. The other individual that I want to mention is Sonia Polanski. Now, oh, yeah. Sonia was the editor for this film. I had met her at Cannes. I was kind of have the hots for her, I think. For I don't know if that's politically correct now, but contextualized this back in 1980. Uh, but I, I, uh, she said that she was an editor, an assistant editor. Now I didn't know what an assistant editor even did, but she worked for Martin Scorsese and Woody Allen, and um, she worked on Raging Bull and was an assistant for Thelma Shoemaker, and later on after this film worked for John Sayles, and um, so Sonia came from New York to actually edit this film, and um, you know was. Uh, you know, remarkable, you know, and I just remember one time I got so stoned, um, uh, why, you know, because I, I, and editing something, um, and then in the morning, Sonia saw what I did, and just, I, I know, and from that moment on, I never am stoned whenever I edit, <laughs> and um, Sonia is just one of those, like, had a musical ear, you know, that was just so incredible. We had, we wanted to, the, the, the thing that, I know it seems like almost a misnomer to have an editor here or talk about editing because, but um, because these, we preserve the integrity of the pieces because they're, the length of the pieces are, are what they played. And that was unusual for a documentary because mm -hmm. usually it's like, oh, we're going to have, a minute and then we're going to cut away and you know um to whatever birds flying and um but we kept this as a performance film and the performance film um for me was the you know this film and uh poetry in motion a film that i did after this were were anthology kind of films uh in the sense that they were like Woodstock. They were performance films, and and back and now, like, um, it's just for the record, you know. So like forty years, we're in a park, <laughs> being able to watch, why well, bring that alive? Well, but I, I it, have a it, question about that yeah, actually. Yeah. So sorry, um, I can go on and on. Um, I saw the film for the first time as a young man before I was a musician, and it had a huge impact on me, and the iconic. Uh, footage 
that stuck with me and sticks to me with me to this day is the Cecil Taylor solo piano footage mm -hmm. in a white room. Yeah. And I, I'm curious to know about the impulse for that particular shot, that particular footage. Yeah, that's John Lennon. That, that was when I saw Imagine. You know, that was, and we, we were in a studio, so we had the art, and I actually hired an art director for a documentary. Hmm. I mean, it was just, it was completely every uh, approach that you would normally have for a documentary, um, w I just threw out the window, because we, we really wanted to give respect to those artists. The, the amazing thing was Cecil came, first of all, we had the Bosendorfer, which, mm -hmm. you know, um, which- No small was, feet. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is a, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, which is just like an unbelievable um, image, you know, in a white space. But also Cecil saw it and he got a sweat uh, suit, specifically in a white hat, uh, to um, to go along with the, with, with, and it had sequence on it. Um, the interview of Cecil is in the Windsor Arms Hotel, which I got kicked out of um, because I was wearing, um, uh, work boots and, or something, and they wouldn't let me in, even though I was like paying for everybody's uh, room there. Um, but yeah, no, I remember when Bill Dixon, uh, sorry, Bill Smith once said to me, he said, there's God, and then there's Cecil Taylor, but not necessarily in that order. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Cecil was a, um, and the one thing that Cecil said to me was, you could hear Michael Jackson in my work. You could hear Marvin Gaye in my work. You can hear, you know, all it, and it, it came clear, even as I read, um, if you read Archie Shepp, who's the last surviving artist in this movie, in the Guardian interview, he's in his 80s, and he's talking about how this is a music of struggle, how this is a music of, uh, you know, against oppression, and how this music is, is, is very much part of the black, um, uh, black history, and, and and it's a continuum, and this and it, it doesn't it is it evolves, and um, I I was a um, I, you can hear this you can hear James Brown in this mu in music, and it's just sort of like, I, and I and I it's not that my ear is finely tuned. I mean I I I I just. I have a, a greater, uh, um, in, in looking at just the context of these four individuals and the October Revolution concerts, it comes out of a place and a time, and it still is, um, it still is a, uh, a music that's vital. And, um, and there are players now that, whether you're from the UK or you're, you know, from Hamilton, wherever, you know, it's just like this is a genre uh, or it's a, it's a uh, an art form, you know, that is a um, that is just um, it has a lot. It's deeper than than uh, you know. If you if you if you if you have deep listening, it really can um, take you to places that I, you know that. I've you know. I've long thought thought of it more of an ethos than a genre. Yeah, exactly. It is a state of mind for sure. Absolutely. And yeah. uh, I think, yeah. uh, as with oneself, understanding it is a lifelong process. I yeah, think. that's right. That's right. And, and in a way, I just like I, you know, I I, I like discovering new places. Like Pharaoh Saunders doing that DJ mix. Fuck, it's so incredible. You know, sorry for my language, um, but it's like the you know there there is it's an evolving kind of thing and. Uh, um, I don't know. I mean, I just have, I, there's so much of it now. When I worked at Sam's, you couldn't find it. Those albums were deleted. Yes. There were like 1,000 copies of it. And, you know, now it's sort of like you can stream all of this, you know, stuff. Now, I don't know if you're going to get Alan Silva's you know, whatever or, you know. Uh, and if you want it, it's say, out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you, can, you know, go on mm. Discogs or something. I, you know, I do miss. Kind of incredible. Uh, Entities such as the Jazz and Blues Center, well, that's and, the and sad Bill part. Smith, and yeah. Coda Wasn't Magazine. Jazz, jazz Wings too was another. Was there another record store too? Yes, jazz, Wing Jazz. Wing Jazz. Yes, was another uh, one that I went to. People and organizations that would point you to the music were very important. Yeah, because otherwise it could get lost. Yeah, but you'd meet someone like Bill, and you'd be uh, who was a fanatic, and yeah. he would say yes. 
you got yeah, to go Yeah, no, events. no, he was, he was someone that, you know, we, we all need these, like, individuals who are, who are, um, I don't know, amplifier. I mean, that's why I uh, connect with, with both Gary and Bill, because I just sort of felt, um, you know, what, what D'Antonio once said to me was, you have two reasons for doing anything. You love something intensely or you dislike something intensely. And you know, we're, we love this music so much that, I mean, I went on to uh, make a, a number of movies that, uh, that, and have come back to jazz. We're just released, executive produced this movie called Fire Music, which is oh, coming yeah. out um, next week, I think. Uh, just opened New York. That's um, that's your work. Is, yeah, I executive produced that film. No I also, kidding. Um, huh. Executive produced a film called I called him Morgan, which is um, about Lee Morgan, and um, oh, yes. that mm -hmm. uh, uh, the murder of Lee Morgan. So, um, you know, I'm still in the like I'm still in. I don't know. I, I'm like this. That's this is the music that speaks to me the most, uh, for sure. And it still speaks from the margins after all these and years. And it's still in the mar yeah, you know, and I kind of, maybe that's why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've never been kind of mainstream, you know. Um, you know, <laughs> that's the thing, so. Mm -hmm. But you, it, it is a, uh, it's a trip to like, I, I don't know, like I, I, I don't know, I, I, uh, I mean, I, Anyway, yeah, if you have a, you have to experience the film, I guess, and that's it, you know the new criticism is is all about where the artist, the, the you know the the writer or the auteur doesn't matter, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know it's mm -hmm. just the work itself, and that's the way I sort of like it too. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, these are the, it's the work that you're looking at, you know, and whether what my intentions were just is like were. Yeah, well, I going back to that that iconic Cecil Taylor footage. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, of course, when you say it, uh, uh, yeah, that makes sense that the, it's a c the connection with Imagine. But over the years, as I watched it, I thought very much about what David brought up before, how it's a music that comes from rather shitty yeah, context, sure. and it, it yeah. deserves very obviously to be elevated. Right. And that was, to me, very clearly an, a gesture of elevating the music. Yeah. Then the White Walls bespoke uh, a relationship with American modernism broadly conceived, mm -hmm. including the abstract expressionist painters, so, yep. li so lionized, but also all white, mostly men. Uh, and that, that, that gesture uh, cinematically uh, aligns Cecil Taylor's work justifiably with the, the giants of American modernism and other disciplines. Anyway, that's that's how I read it, and it was cool. it was yeah. it was inspiring to see that, um, and also it clarified some of the musical material that was um, being played in a in a rather uh, inspiring way. So thank you for that. You know, um, Cecil Taylor's fingers went faster than the speed of, of uh, <laughs> twenty four <laughs> frames, so <laughs> it, we would it would be impossible to sync. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is at the very end when he's looking at his um, hand. Oh yeah, yeah. He's bleeding. Yeah. He's actually ble his his fingers are um, bleeding from from playing, and that's you know that is how intense like the, the that those performances are. I mean, it's really just a, it's kind of remarkable. I just we, we hope your appetite something. has been whetted for this footage. Yeah. It's really special. Um, Bill Dixon's uh, performance was at the edge, and we recorded uh, the interview yes. at, the, mm -hmm. at the edge, which is Gary Topps Club.